This is Joe Featherall, first year student at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. And I'll be presenting a learning objective on hemostasis. Now this can be a complex topic, so I will present a simplified model that should give enough detail for a working knowledge, but also be simple enough to be memorable and easily digestible. So let's dive right in. Starting off, we have a blood vessel depicted here showing endothelium and a supportive collagen matrix or a subendothelial collagen matrix. Internal to the blood vessel in this model, we'll have a biconcave disc, our red blood cell. We'll be looking at a few important proteins, including von Wildebrandt factor, also plasminogen, which we'll abbreviate PLG. And of course, we could not talk about hemostasis without talking about our platelets that we'll depict with these purple circles. Platelets carry granules. The dense granules carry ADP, and the alpha granules are carrying von Wildebrandt factor, as well as fibrinogen, which we'll depict with these little blue eyes. The platelets also have receptors by which they're activated. The first of these will be shown here in purple, and this is called glycoprotein 2B9. And glycoprotein 2B9 binds closely to von Wildebrandt factor. So these two form a pair. The second receptor that we'll talk about is known as glycoprotein 2B3A. And 2B3A binds closely to fibrinogen. The last receptor that we'll talk about is glycoprotein 1A2A. And this binds directly to collagen depicted by our pink squiggles. Normally, the endothelium protects from the aggregation of platelets. And it does this by secreting nitric oxide, which is also a vasodilator, prostacyclin, PGI2, and also an interesting surface protein that's known as tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And this prevents not only the aggregation of platelets, but also the induction of the clotting cascade. Now let's imagine that an injury to this blood vessel occurs and we end up with these endothelial cells being damaged or removed. The tissue factor pathway inhibitor is also removed and it stops producing nitric oxide and prostacyclin. When this occurs, the collagen is directly exposed to the plasma and a protein is also exposed that's known as tissue factor. The exposed collagen can be bound directly by the von Wildebrandt factor. Additionally, endothelial secre cells secrete von Wildebrandt factor that binds to the collagen. Then the platelets can use their glycoprotein 2B9 and bind to von Wildebrandt. And then platelets also can use their glycoprotein 1A2A to bind directly to the collagen. And as you can see, we have platelets adhering. When they adhere, these receptors also cause a signaling cascade to occur inside the platelet, and 
This causes some significant changes to the platelet. First of all, the platelet changes its shape, expanding its surface area and becoming very irregular. The release of the granules causes AT ADP to have paracrine actions, as well as autocrine actions. And the ADP changes the conformation of our receptors, particularly our 2B3A receptors. These receptors can then accept fibrinogen. The von Wildebrandt factor that's released can then activate other platelets in the area. And these platelets then continue to propagate this aggregation until we have a large network of platelets aggregated. This structure, however, is not tremendously stable. It operates very quickly to stop the flow, but to last over a long term of hemostasis, there has to be another structural addition. And this is provided by secondary hemostasis that's known as the coagulation cascade. And this is started directly by tissue factor. Tissue factor starts the induction of the extrinsic pathway. Now we're going to simplify this a bit so that it's digestible, but we still want to get across the key points. And the extrinsic pathway causes the activation, denoted by A, of factor 10. Clotting factor 10 then cleaves prothrombin to create thrombin. And this is where the cascade becomes quite interesting. The traditional model was taught that there are sort of two pathways, the extrinsic and the intrinsic, and they're somewhat independent. The contemporary view is that thrombin actually starts the intrinsic pathway, and the intrinsic pathway also leads to the activation of factor 10. As you can see, this creates a positive feedback loop that produces a tremendous amplification of the tissue factor signal, creating a lot of thrombin. This thrombin has two jobs. The first job is to activate clotting factor 13, activate, denoted by A, and the second is to take our fibrinogen and convert it to fibrin. Fibrin can then be cross-linked by 13. Activated factor 13 starts cross-linking our fibrin, and we end up with a network of fibrin that ties all of these proteins and platelets together. We also get our red blood cells into the aggregate, and we get a very solid hemostatic clot. Eventually, this clotting will stop the blood flow, and healing will occur. So we'll have re-endothelialization, or um, sort of a scarring effect, and we won't need the clot anymore. Further, the exposure of tissue factor to the bloodstream will stop and our clotting cascade will stop. And since clots can be dangerous and cause ischemia to important tissues, the body requires a way to get rid of this clot. And that is mediated by our plasminogen. Tissue plasminogen activator or the urinary type plasminogen activator acts on plasminogen, cleaves it to form the active form, which is called plasmin. Plasmin can then begin to chop up our fibrin molecules. And in doing this, it begins to release everything that's been aggregated, 
So we have the blood flow washing away our clot. It's taken back up into the bloodstream. Now, there are remnants of this clot that are left floating around, and particularly one that has a quite useful clinical correlation is the D domains of fibrin that are linked together into a dimer, and this is known as a D dimer, and it is simply a remnant of the clotting cascade. This D dimer can be tested for in blood samples and gives the clinician clues that there was a clotting process and then the degradation of that clotting occurring inside the human body. In summary, we've gone over primary hemostasis, the platelet plug. We've also covered secondary hemostasis, which is the coag coagulation cascade. And we have also gone over the process of fibrinolysis and the return to the ground zero state. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video as much as I've enjoyed making it, and we'll see you next time.